if, it's if, after five. if it's after five, well, then that tells them if it's okay in the window, they didn't take it down, maybe something's wrong. Let's knock on the door. That's why they take it down. It took me a while to figure that out, too. Yeah. Why are you making them take it down at five o'clock? So that way they know it wasn't just left up and they're maybe inside, yeah. injured or hurt. Um, and so they came up with this program on their own with those. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, so develop something within your own neighborhood that works, that you have some kind of communication and collaboration and you know who your neighbors are and you check on them because we're all in this together. Disaster and emergency preparedness is the most important thing uh, we can do individually but collectively with each other because I will tell you it's not a matter of if the next one's going to hit, it's when and we're well overdue. If you talk to the U.S. Geological Surveys and Dr. Lucy Jones and all the experts out there, it's not a matter of if the next one's going to hit, it's when. Um, and so we have to prepare and take it very, very seriously. So anyway, I want to thank you again for coming out. I want, didn't want to interrupt the presentation, but I wanted to uh, definitely stop by and thank you because this is critically important. So thanks again. Just so the councilman knows, I actually sleep with my shoes on. Well, well, and, and that's too much information. And, and, and what he neglected to mention to you is he stopped arresting people because it was costing him votes. That's true. Yes. That's why I stopped writing tickets. <laughs> Another surprise from Senator Hertzberg's office, Marco. Santana. I'm a district representative with the office of State Senator Bob Hertzberg. Um, I'll be quick. There's no way I can follow the council members, so I won't try to. But I actually wanted to come up here to say thank you to the Granada Hill South Neighborhood Council, and we have a certificate of recognition for putting this event together uh, for you both. And I'll get one to Mike specifically. But, but thank you so much for having this and for having us. Thank you, Mr. Please stand. This is the mayor of Granada Hills. Yeah. Yeah. And without further ado. Thank you. And it was very nice to see Councilman Mitchell Englander stop by. That was very gracious of you. I appreciate your time. Okay, but you're going to have to make sure I say it right because I'll probably be able to correct some of my slides here. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, without further ado, we're going to get into this uh, slideshow. And basically, the subjects it's going to cover are earthquake preparedness and also nuclear disaster. So, pre-disaster planning is the most important thing we can have. Um, we also have disaster action plans, post-disaster life-saving. We're not going to cover that tonight. That goes into a whole big set of uh, skills and post-disaster survival. It, that's mostly for like the nuclear fallout and that kind of thing, so we're not gonna get into that. So the types of disasters we have that are of imminent threat to us here in the North Valley are earthquake, firestorm, like in Porter Ranch and the recent Sunland Tahunga, landslides, oh, maybe if there's a lot of st fires, and basically this, the civil unrest, with, you know, we had that with the Rodney King riots and so forth, and then also the nuclear attack with North Korea and other uh, powerful nations that are now up to speed on nuclear weapons. There's always a threat of nuclear attack. Next slide. So earthquakes, let's get into earthquakes. That's why we're here tonight. So on average, the San Andreas Fault, the major fault in California, erupts every 150 years. Um, my research tells me that 1857 was the last major earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. However, I've been corrected by Dr. Lucy Jones, and she says, no, we're not just seven years overdue, Sherry. We're 150 or 300 years overdue. So that was not a big enough one in Fort Tejon in 1857. I just thought it was. 
So anytime uh, we're overdue, it gets a little bit dicey and we're all shaking in our boots wondering, when is it going to happen? The Northridge earthquake was not a major earthquake. That was, you know, a decent sized one. It only lasted about 20 seconds. When we say major earthquake, we're talking 8.0 8 to 8.3 on the Richter scale. Okay, so we're really 150 years overdue. So when will this happen? Like I said, the 94 earthquake, it was um, major but small compared to the 8.0 and up Richter scale ones. If you look at this slide, the darker the red, the larger it was. And so the 9 to 9.5 Richter scale are the big dark red circles on the far left and up at the top. And you can see the, uh, the California coast there where it says next, there are no red circles. We are so overdue, it's getting scary. Next slide. Okay, so Northridge was 6.7 on the Richter scale. It only shook, shook for 20 minutes, I'm sorry, 20 seconds, and the ground only moved average of one foot. Sure, there was places where the freeway looked like it gapped two feet or slid back and forth two feet, but the average was one foot of movement. The big one that's eminent is eight to 8.3 on the Richter scale. It's gonna be three minutes and 20 seconds. That is really long. That's gonna feel like a piano recital or something next to these little 20 minute shakers. And the ground movement, 36 feet, that's 36 feet. Can you imagine the gap? That's like that big Charlton Heston earthquake movie in the 70s. The earth opens up and people fall in. That's a, it's very dramatic. We can't even comprehend that. Next slide. Okay, so I'm not going to read all these, but I want to focus on the homeless uh, bullet there in the middle. Um, with all the buildings collapsing, although in California, and especially Los Angeles County, we're getting better and better about retrofitting. Like Mike's, Michael Benedetto said, they're starting to retrofit the county buildings and all this. But um, basically, if, if the amount of homeless, of 255,000 homeless, new homeless, can you imagine? We're already over the 50,000 threshold in LA County. That's the biggest, worst amount of homeless in the United States ever. And a major earthquake would set us six times that. So it would be catastrophic on a level we can't even comprehend. Um, now, how many, now let's talk about the firefighters and the first responders. So firefighters and paramedics, they're, they could address about 1,000. They have about 273 units to come out and, you know, people that are stranded or stuck in their houses and the buildings falling on them and this and that. But, on average, they can only address 1.1% of the problems per, in the first day or so. So if you think that, you know, a beam falls on you from your house and you couldn't, you know, get to a duck cover and hold under your desk or your dining room table, you, you're not going to be getting help in the next few days. In fact, they used to say when I was growing up that it was, you had to prepare for three days of food, water, and so forth. Now, seven days minimum, most likely you may as well prepare for three weeks. So gone are the three days worth of canned goods you can just carry a little knapsack. You should have seven to 21 days worth of drinking water, canned goods, dried food, all that kind of stuff, bandages, supplies, napkins, diapers if you have babies, all that kind of stuff. 21 days. And of course, oh yes, and prescription medicine. I, I take medication and, and I always forget to stockpile it. And if you, you know, if you refill a prescription every 25 days, which they let you, at the end of the year, you got an extra month's worth. So, all right, next slide. So we must prepare now to take care of each other. So pre-disaster planning, that's where it's at. Without planning, you're not gonna survive. Let's go through this. This is just reinforcing your house. This is things that we already, it's, it's very technical and not, not that interesting. But here, let's stop on this. I know everybody here has a, has a designer 1970s wood panel bedroom like this, right? <laughs> that is so chic. I don't know how all the slides are where it came from, but it's Brady Bunch or something. So we know not to have a sharp picture above our head. And we know that if we had those kind of like semi-built-ins that they should be bolted, and can't we get some color in that in that bedspread? Really? Yeah. Okay, but and, and and I know the shoes are hiding under the bed. We just can't see them. Next slide. And we know how to bolt those in. Next slide. This is pretty basic stuff. Next slide. 
okay, we're bolting, we're doing this. We're not going to have glass near our head, it's going to shatter. We can have a teddy bear, that's okay. Keep going. Don't go, oh, there's the shoes. And there are working batteries in that flashlight. And you might want to keep an extra set of batteries, like in the drawer. Okay. What? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. And the mirrors are, don't, don't. In fact, why do they even want those mirrors on the, you can go look in the bathroom mirror. Okay, so, um, next slide. This is all just retrofitting. And then you can get into a lot of detail with don't put bleach next to, you know, these other, other chemicals. But the main thing is limit, isolate, and eliminate. So if you know your chemistry or someone in your household knows chemistry, there's certain combinations you shouldn't have next to each other. And that gets really technical. And I'm sure there may be further presentations tonight that go into that. And then the water heater, you have to have that bolted. If you have a 50 gallons of water in your backyard, you, you want to keep that secure. And then, actually, this is a really good thing. I did not know this, that if you flush annually, I mean, <laughs> sorry. If you flush your hot water heater out to get the silt and the dirt and stuff out, it's a good drinking water source. So, <laughs> all right. This, this is, has so many things in there, we, we can't spend the time on it tonight. Um, but just like he mentioned medications, prescription medications, that's always first and foremost. You can't go without your blood pressure medication or your diabetic medication. Um, there's all sorts of things in there that I know, people that are at these seminars, I know a lot of you, most of you know this stuff. These are just really good reminders. <coughs> Next slide. So the, this goes into food shelf life. Let's keep continue. I'm looking for the. Let's go flash forward to the nuclear disaster stuff. Okay, so now we've covered preparation. Oh, one one last thing about backpacks. How many here, here have kids of school age? I have twins that are ninth graders, and for eight years they've always wanted a new backpack every year. And every year I say no, use last year's. But then I started thinking, wait a minute, I can use last year's backpack and put fill it up with disaster stuff, put one in my car. One under my bed, one in my attic, one in my garage. So I have like eight backpacks from the, the past years and they're just dispersed throughout my house and cars so that I don't have to go buy a new one. So those bags that Bill Hopkins gives away every year at the, at the fair, uh, or the preparedness fair are good, but the backpack you can actually sling on your back and take it with you with your supplies if you have to you know, leave your house if it's not inhabitable. Okay, so disaster action plans. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to skip through some of these. Keep going. Tornado. Okay, stop. Nuclear disaster. So with North Korea and all the nuclear threats, um, this is something that we should be thinking about. Um, a terrorist attack, a power plant accident, those backpack bombs that was like at the Boston Marathon several years ago, and then this dirty bomb. That's just having contaminants, not really mass destruction, but enough contaminants or airborne diseases, um, biological warfare that can really mess up our, our lungs and our health. Okay, next slide. So, this is a good slide. The far left is, it's hard to read, but the very far, small two mushrooms on the far left are Hiroshima at 15 kilotons of energy, and the next one is Nagasaki at 20 kilotons of, Naga, of uh, energy released on a nuclear bomb. And the little mountain that's just below the airplane, that's Mount Everest. So that's how big the mushroom goes on a nuclear bomb. Now what's scary is, when I was growing up and we studied Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that was history in the 70s that we learned about, I never dreamed that there'd be those big mushrooms on the right like that. That's really scary. So the terrorist threat from North Korea is 160 kilotons. 10 times the energy released of Hiroshima. And if you know your history and what happened with Hiroshima and Nagasaki and all the, the terrible health hazards and effects of all that nuclear waste, um, that, that's really tragic. But it is survivable if you know what to do. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So the, the bottom part, the red on the very bottom, that's kind of like considered like the epicenter or the point where it, the bomb goes off, and then the energy radiates outward, just like the seismic waves of an earthquake. Next slide. 